Okay, good morning everybody for this uh, new installment of Science at 10. Uh, today we have Rachel who is going to talk to us about a very burning topic which is uh, in fact fire in the Amazon and more largely fire in the humid tropic forests. And she's going to present the case of the Amazon where in fact there is an increase of fire because of changing climate condition because of human activity. And I think that she's going to focus on uh, the fact that there is a lot of management rules in place, but these management rules are not really informed by what is happening on the field and, and, and mainly with the shifting cultivation. So I will keep it short. Uh, Rachel, is your call now, 10 minutes to the point. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good morning. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Rachel Carmenter. I'm here at C4 as a postdoc in the Environment Programme. The work I'm presenting today actually formed part of my PhD, which I undertook at Lancaster Environment Center. And um, whilst I began the work there, it was published last year, by which point I was here at C4. So it's quite a nice opportunity to present this morning since we have visitors from Lancaster here today. My PhD focused on trying to understand smallholder fire management in the Brazilian Amazon using a range of geographic scales, and each had its own complementary methodology. This morning I'm going to talk about the local level work which I did, um, engaging with ethnographic research methods and some participatory uh, work also. So I'm sure you're aware that there's an increasing problem of fire in the Amazon. Really since the late 80s and 90s there have been large, um, some call mega fires throughout the region which have um, burnt in states such as Acre and Pará um, in the north of Brazil. There are multiple impacts of these fires. We can think about the environmental consequences, the biodiversity implications, the greenhouse gas emissions related to global environmental change. Also, the economic um, costs associated with fires, so for example, airport closures as a result of the smoke and the haze, and the social and health impacts with the respiratory problems um, experienced by people living in the region. And also, um, Difficulties, for example, at the local level related to navigating, for example, in rural um, communities, navigating rivers becomes problematic or hunting because not only from the loss of biodiversity, but also the difficulty of hunting when there's a lot of debris caused from the fire um, lying around the forest floor. So the causes of these fires are largely anthropogenic, um, human ignition sources by both large landholders and smallholders. Fire um, is sort of central to land clearing, so for example, setting, um, clearing land to put a cattle ranch by perhaps a large landholder, or at the same time, smallholders use fire to clear the land um, for their swidden fields. But for smallholders, they also need the fire because it really is an important um, element of their subsistence agriculture via the input of nutrients that then um, aid production in those fields. So the smallholders are, at the same time, really part of the anti-fire sort of rhetoric that you find in the media and also in a lot of the literature, um, because their agricultural practices are perceived as relatively backwards, and um, they're really sort of linked then to this anti-fire um, campaign almost. And so whilst the different management um, interventions and policy prescriptions in place aren't only aimed at smallholders but all fire users, really they do sort of come into the line of fire, if you like, um, when you think about these different policy prescriptions. So at the same time, these management solutions don't really appear to be working because fire does continue to increase throughout the Amazon, and so it seemed like a timely piece of work to be done to really try to understand well, what's happening, why is there this gap between policy and practice. And so um, that's what we were trying to do with this piece of work. And the methods involved were I got to spend six months in the Brazilian Amazon in the state of Pará, quite close, relatively close to the town of Santarém along the river Arapiuns. I worked in two extractive reserves on either side of that river. And this work really, um, like I said, is the ethnography from that. So I went to the fields with people and I engaged in conversations about their histories of fire, experience of fire. I got to see the management practices that people used in the plots when they were burning. And I was interested also to talk about 
their awareness of any of the rules that exist you know, regarding those fires and um, their management practices. That then was complemented when I got back to the UK with a review of the different policy and management interventions and the rules dictated there that smallholders and other fire users should adhere to when they're um, burning if they want to have a legal burn. And what became quite clear was um, that there really is a large disparity between what happens and um, you know, what is dictated as, a, as the rules if you would like to have a legal fire. So thinking about this, it seemed that there were maybe three different themes of these disparities. And the first one, if you like, would be that the policy prescriptions are misaligned with the local reality in terms of the technical capacity. So one of the requirements in all of the policy documents was to build a fire break, um, ranging from two to six meters surrounding the, the area to be burnt. That was something which we never observed um, happening. The reason for which is that would be an absolutely enormous um, labor investment to build your, your clear land six meters circumference surrounding the plot. Um, but not when you think that smallholders are largely using machetes, you know, for their agriculture, um, for at least for the clearing stage. So then you can also think um, in terms of, just to go back to the fire break actually, so if we think that there's this limitation of technical capacity, there is also really there seem to be a kind of scepticism at the local level about the, the the degree to which you really could rely on a fire break to contain your fire. So smallholders would remark that if you wanted to use a fire break, it would have to be maybe, you know, three or four times the size of six meters if you really wanted to contain it because you couldn't control, for example, the wind picking up, which could then take the embers into the forest and could start a, a conflagration, especially, for example, if there happened to be bamboo around, which is highly flammable. But what I did see happening was um, some kind of compromise because people tended to invigilate their burns and then they would, if they noticed that the fire was, was beginning to creep beyond the area intended to be burnt, they would use the machete to clear a small kind of a trail that would be free of debris and that would help to slow down the fire and um, aid in the control of, of the burn. The year I was there wasn't an extreme drought year, and although I didn't see any fire escape during the year I was there, you know, I couldn't mention about how you might rely on these small hamais, they're called, um, you know, under those kinds of conditions. There was also really a bureaucratic misalignment. So policy documents would ask um, that people would take their legal tenure, their land title, and register the, the intent to have a burn, and then they could uh, receive a permit. But those land title documents often aren't in ownership at, you know, at the local level, so that's problematic. Also, there was a series of rules which sort of compromise um, the local requirement for a good burn. So at the local level, what would be a good burn is a good strong fire that would really rid the patch of almost all of the debris um, ready for planting. And to do that, you need to burn in the you know, hot, dry conditions with some wind because the wind helps to carry the flames. Whereas in the policy rules, what's required is that people will burn in the morning because it's a damp and um, to avoid any wind, so to make the fire safer and more controlled. And you found that that just, you know, that didn't happen for the fact that people needed to prioritize um, having a successful burn and also reducing the, the likelihood of needing to have a second burn, which is more labor investment. And in you know, people would, if the burn wasn't too strong and successful, people would gather the remaining vegetation into a pile and burn that, which is additional you know, investment in terms of time and labor. So again, though, you did see some kind of um, compromise at the local level. Although smallholders weren't aware that they were somehow meeting some of the requirements, what they tended to do in their practices would be to set um, a fire on each side of the plot thereby creating backburns, which helps to control the fire, and also burning against the wind, which is um, one of the requirements. So there was a kind of, um, somehow, a compromise being made, although a huge you know, disparity between rules and practice. There were also a series of rules which seemed to be culturally inappropriate. So for example, the 
requirement to, um, for smallholders to advise their community three days in advance of the location and the time where they would burn, which is something, again, it didn't happen, partly because I would say that the rhythm of life in, you know, in the smallholder context just is not that formalized. And whilst at the same time smallholders were very aware of where their neighbors had got to in their agricultural cycle, because that's a large part of the conversation, um, there wasn't really the, a formal um, you know, setup for announcing when you would burn, partly also because of the unpredictability of weather conditions, which is so central um, in burning practices. So then, thinking about these lines of disparity, we wanted to um, explore a bit more the foundations of that gap. And if you really were to simplify, you could say that there seems to be a good fire, bad fire kind of dichotomy, whereby, you know, at the policy level and in the media and international discourse, there's a lot of anti-fire kind of rhetoric, mega fires, and um, the environmental um, implications of these fires. And there's some kind of alarm and that the situation needs to be controlled. And that's very highly contrasted at the local level where really people think and talk about fire in a very different way. There's a kind of an ease in which fire is used and it's so central to um, agriculture and not only agriculture but daily practices of cooking on you know, natural fires, keeping the community clean of, and safe from the leaves and insects, etc. So there is a real kind of um, juxtaposition between those perceptions of fire and perhaps at the uh, policy level not um, an understanding of the other reality and experience of fire. So to conclude, we tried to think of these, um, these findings and suggest some policy or some recommendations for future management interventions which might be more successful. And the three um, suggestions that we developed were there's clearly a need for more participatory and local level engagement when designing these management interventions to get an idea of smallholder um, capacity and the local reality um, and also to increase the legitimacy of the intervention. And then there's a need perhaps for a more flexible and adaptive management approach whereby, for example, some um, interventions might be required in extreme drought years, but perhaps not necessary for every year. You know, perhaps a different suite of um, management techniques would be appropriate in non-drought years. And finally, for these sorts of um, management um, interventions, particularly, for example, the fire break, um, there has to be some kind of form of external support because um, the technical capacity at the local level is limited. And so that is a brief and hopefully succinct summary of that research, which you can find actually in Human Ecology. It was published last year. Thank you. Thank you. OK, now the floor is yours for your question. People use fire because they cannot do fire break. I mean, fundamentally, so that they don't want to spend their time macheting all the trees. I mean, so that, that's why they fire. If you ask them to do the same thing outside to just control the fire, it doesn't. But I'm just coming from Zambia, and then I've seen some image of village where you have something like 1.2 people per kilometer square, and on the Landsat image, 28 percent of the image is fire scars. Is there a link in your research in the terms of the? the density of people around and the capacity or the willingness to control the fire. So that if there is only the bush behind your field, you burn and that's the bush burning. If it's your neighbor just behind your field, will you control your fire better? Mm. Um, I did try to um, get information around that um, at the decision making level and it seemed to be that um, People prioritise mostly their own assets, so house and crops, um, but also there was a kind of community cohesion, and so people tended to um, yeah, try to protect the crops and the houses of community members. But at the same time, it was never very clear um, if there was an escape fire, blame tended to be kind of thrown around, and it was never, it was always someone from a different community, you know, it was never someone from your own. So it was quite interesting to, to talk about those sorts of, you know, rationales for 
investing actually in the fire break. Another thing that people wanted to, to protect was NTFP. So if, for example, there's a Brazil nut tree or some other um, you know, valuable source of, of non-timber products, people tended to increase their, their management, but never to the point of actually making you know, an enormous fire break. No, thank you. I, did, I thought that was, you know, a, a wonderfully argued, um, a wonderfully well-made argument about, about some of the issues. Um, one of the things I'd like to say is, first of all, uh, the fact that there were all, it seemed to me that in many places fire is just completely forbidden. Uh, the fact that there were already some kind of guidelines how to use fire better already is a step up from the usual kinds of policies, which I think are just completely unrealistic, that just forbid it totally and therefore, you know, just absolutely don't work. Um, otherwise, I'd just like to ask you, um, as you know, we've been working a lot on migration and you're one of the people who's been working on migration. And I know that in the Western Amazon, um, a few of the people we've been working with have have um, shown that more, the more people who go into the city, um, the actual, the more fire there is, the more, the more escaped fires there are. The fewer people are out there in the countryside, sort of the more fire. Could you, and, and um, urbanization and migration seems to be a continuing um, issue here. So could you comment on that? And I, I'd like to make one other comment before I sort of give up this. Um, so that, that was one of my questions. Um, another question is one of the problems that we really saw in the Western Amazon was the fact that there was a real mix of uses. So there were people managing pastures using fire and there, were, there was also a mix of uses and a mix of, of types of ownership and management. So there were absentee landlords, there were people who were doing pastures rather than than um, agricultural fields per se. And then there were the shifting cultivators and each of them had sort of different issues involved and we found that it was partly that mix that also led to, to the problems with fire. Could you also comment on that? Mm. Um, well, taking that point first, where we were working in those extractive reserves, there's really, the, you know, the land use is more or less Sweden. There is not cattle or, you know, um, I know in other reserves, like in Accra and Chikamendas, now there's more um, cattle there, but in these reserves it's really just shifting cultivation. So um, I didn't really observe those sorts of dynamics that you're mentioning, although um, Miguel was talking to me yesterday about the, the need to kind of have someone back in the field from because of so many people having plots but actually living in the towns. Uh, we didn't really observe that um, in this research site. And related to your first question, which was, could you briefly remind me? <laughs> Migrating. Fewer, fewer oh, people, yeah. well, fewer people, more problematic fires. I suppose um, I do remember going to some plots which were not abandoned, but the owners had moved to Santarém and they hadn't been back for some months. And people, um, the people who I was walking past with, were kind of saying that at some point that land will have to be returned to the community um, and someone else can have ownership of there because it's, it's not managed and the fact that it's not managed means it's slightly more you know, susceptible, I guess, to not being, um, for somebody not bothering to take certain precautions if burning close by. But I mean, again, there was really quite limited, I suppose, migration from those communities to Santorin, so it's not something that I saw happening a lot. Hi, Rachel. Thanks a lot. That was really interesting. And I saw really very similar things happening in Indonesia. Um, my question is, what are the disincentives to not burn, if any? And who would give those disincentives, if any? Thanks. To not burn at all, you mean? Or to? Are there or not? Um, no, people, you know, your burning is it's sort of expected, it's part of the agriculture, you know, everybody can burn. Um, now, when I was working, the reserve councils were trying to limit the area that people would be burning, so to um, limit the number of plots that people could have, 
uh, but that was more to do with um, the land in production than anything related to um, a fire, a limitation on fire use, really. Hi. You said um, at the start that you're interested in uh, finding out about smallholder awareness of policy recommendation, but you didn't actually go on to say anything about that during the talk. I wonder if you did find their views on the policy recommendations and kind of linked to that, whether they had their own recommendations, which you kind of alluded to in the last bit. Um, I did, when because we held some different sort of group discussions with people to understand more and talk more at length about fire specifically, and something that was really interesting was the fact that people often had ideas about what the policy prescriptions were, but that um, weren't true, so almost kind of like myths, not, you know, like um, a kind of a, a story that builds up over time and so people for example would say that one of the requirements was you had to burn in December and how crazy was that because December is already you know the rains are coming and the fact that such a stupid thing would exist is because all of these rules are written in the towns and the cities where they have no idea what's going on here you know in the on the ground and that we people would say that they were forgotten from the whole um, kind of bureaucratic and policy process so, you know, I did ask people their, their knowledge of the different requirements and often the knowledge was extremely limited or just completely, you know, off the ball, like, for example, this. Thank you very much for the really interesting presentation. I just had a quick question. So it seems like from the discussion, I get a sense that you know smallholder burning is actually quite in, in limited land. But then the discourses over forest fire seems to be like much more large scale. So um, is it like certain types of burning that's being condoned or burning like in general that's, that's I mean, sort of condemned? Well, um, the anti-fire sort of discourse, I would say, is yeah, related to these wildfires that spread, um, and definitely implicated in that discourse are the smallholders. That's, their burns are relatively small, but there are many of them. Um, but I think it's mostly also linked to the fact that the agriculture isn't really respected, you know, it's regarded as a kind of a backwards type of a practice that needs modernizing and improving. And so that pulls them in then to the target of these kind of anti-fire um, campaigns and discourses. There was a big campaign and program on slash and mulch in mm. contrast with slash and burn in the state of Para. How did they get any attention or competition with slash and burn? Um, I know of a couple of different slash and mulch initiatives. Um, so far as I understand, they've had quite limited success, partly because of difficulties you know, of trying to access these riverine, largely riverine communities and delivering machinery required for the mulching um, procedure. But it is something that's still sort of on the horizon as a potential alternative to slash and burn or swidden. that there is a need for the policies to take a, a, to, to adopt more flexible and, and to understand more the flexibility and how management systems can adapt. But I think that's what academics, they are calling for this, uh, for policies to acknowledge the, the fact that they, well, they need to recognize the fact that there's, there's a need for more flexibility and, mm -hmm. and adaptation. But, and, and that's the same when you think on land use, fires, and forest management, but how do you see why, what are the main obstacles for this to happen? Because anyway, the main policy discourses are, are going against these perspectives. So, and is there some scope for reconciling this, these different policy discourses and perspectives? So, can I just, I was finding it difficult to hear the last part of what you said, but basically to what sorts of, um, of venues could be used to create these kinds of adaptive flexible. Well, I suppose really there needs to be more um, 
forums for exchange at least, an exchange of understandings, I would say would be a starting point of that. From how I understand, there's really a complete disjunct between where the policy is formulated and you know where it's supposed to be having this uptake. So some of the more successful um, management interventions were at a, at a lower level involving you know NGOs and a few um, state representatives and community councils and you know different entities working in the region and that there was a management intervention program designed via that kind of stakeholder engagement which seemed to be the most um, realistic and engaging and actually therefore have the largest kind of uptake in the area. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, there seems to be a lot of enthusiasm, or at least I get a lot of emails about biochar, you know, and uh, mostly coming from, from NGOs or whatever working in Amazonia or people interested in the, in, the, in the issue or in this technique. And that's, after all, uh, largely, at least from their point of view, I think mostly uh, based on uh, the sophistication of indigenous burning practices in Amazonia and sort of using, uh, using slash and burn or shifting cultivation techniques. Is this um, at all sort of redeeming the, the, the view of um, shifting cultivation in Amazonia or in other areas or what, what, what do you think is the future here? Um, well, I don't think actually that I could my view of that, I would say, would have to get back to you, you know, because that's something I don't know quite so much about, to be quite honest. Okay, any other last burning question? We have uh, three minutes left. No? Then we need to thank again... Ah, Pablo? No, no, you are moving, no. So we need to thank again Rachel and uh, for the very nice presentation. And I guess this has been published as a paper in Human Ecology. Mm -hmm. So everybody can have an autograph uh, part of the paper if they want. Uh, thank you again and uh, see you for the next Science at 10. <laughs>